I wanted to start the video today by just reminding people of the archive org site that I've got where I upload well as much information as as what I have at the moment that I'm happy on what it is but uh, the reason that I uploaded this channel was um, to this channel was because yeah I've got well, let's just say since I was 16 years of age, I started reading fiction, um, non-fiction. And I wanted to answer the questions that, well, teachers never answered for me. And over a few decades, I ended up with yeah, quite a few books, reading so many. I mean, that was the only way to find anything out was to read books. I know it's becoming a lost art these days, but it really saved me because I was up to about five really big bookcases. And then along came computers and digital books. And the thing being too that uh, out of uh, publish, rare and ones that you couldn't access, suddenly, you know, after a few years, they all started to become accessible. So a lot of the questions that I had, I could then look at. And an interesting one that I actually came across was Edgar Case back in, well, when was it, 2004, three, four. I just happened across the website where they keep all his readings. But I got there by a link and it took me directly to one of his texts for his readings. And I thought, wow, this is brilliant. After years of reading books of other people's opinion of Edgar Case and never actually looking at what he actually said for myself, this was a wonderful opportunity. But then you followed the links and it didn't, you could, you had to be a member and, you know, it was access authorised only. And so what I did was that I just, back then before all the encryption was really, you know, that intense, you could just take off the first part of the address and it would bring you back to a home page. And that way there was over 15,000 Fifteen and a half thousand Edgar Case readings, um, but only about fourteen odd thousand were accessible. A lot of those were um, no reg no registered reading, because he did have a lot of top notch, confidential um, clients. I mean, kings and queens, <laughs> you know, government. He was. Yes, known as the sleeping prophet and a very big curiosity. So for anyone that is interested, this little Edgar Case link here does lead you to all those um, readings. You can read for yourself what the man said. It's amazing work that they've done at uh, where they store all this. They follow his information because right from the word go, they've done follow up on the readings that he's done because the majority of the readings that he did were actually medical. So there was the ability to actually verify what he gave as, um, well, health information, whether it actually made a change or not. But then, it, you know, there's the ones where he does on life readings, he does auras, um, dreams, past lives. Um, I mean, there's just, a lot of other things that he delves into and the interesting one that he does on himself where there's a lot of follow through like I think that's two reading number 262 some of them the readings actually have a lot of follow-up readings and each reading will refer to the next anyway that's completely off subject for the other things that I wanted to say to people but I also wanted to uh, bring to people's attention that um, I spent most of my life in search of greater truths 
and I could never ever say for all the thousands and thousands of books that I've read for the different subjects you name it I've covered it and you know what I've done some things that most people don't I have translated hieroglyphs and cuneiform for myself translated the sacred hymn of uh, St John the Baptist I don't take others people work people's word for it I've translated the uh, Unus pyramid the texts in there tell you what that's some amazing stuff so that when it comes down to uh, what goes on in the real world there are a lot of things that because we accept things as basic facts because we live under certain rules and conditions that we all accept exist some of those things can be claimed as factual and truth from the perspective of the confinement that we put on ourselves to live under see most of the time my thoughts are much deeper not on the reality that is existing in this planet but more how do we achieve a better reality because let's face it take a good look at the world <laughs> it needs a clean up and the only way it's going to get a clean up is if we clean ourselves up but someone brought up a very interesting point and made me think the other night and I thought yes I should mention this to people this person said to me you don't care what other people think about you <laughs> it's like no you got it right mate well the it's oversimplified in saying that I don't care yes I care but ultimately there's there's one person that I've got to answer to and that I've got to live with 24 7 and that's myself that's the person I answer to first I answer to my conscience to what I believe is right and wrong so ultimately if you want to challenge me on what I believe is right and wrong you don't come from the wrong side of the fence and tell me oh you know the truth I can tell you after decades of study I could I could challenge people on so many of their perceived facts and truths but that's not my place to we all come to our own perception of what truth is but facts facts that we accept that are conditioned by the laws that we make that's yeah well again everything is open to interpretation and from what perspective you're looking at it like I'm sure a crook doesn't look at uh, the perspective of that is actually you know if that was being done to me how would I feel because you know before you do something to another human being the first thing you ask yourself is would I like that being done to me and if you can answer no straight away why should you be doing it to somebody else so yes first you must answer to yourself then it does not matter what others think because you don't have to answer to them you have to answer to yourself you got to live with yourself and a lot of people you know I don't know how they dance around making the their version of reality around the lies they fabricate I really don't know how they can live with themselves but maybe that's why one lie begets another lie begets another lie because every time you make a lie to try and cover up the wrong you know you've done you then have to make another lie to cover up that lie because then that lie might be discovered I mean it is just so complicated when people lie and if you're not an absolute genius you're gonna get caught out lying and the thing is that there are people out there that have got natural built-in lie detectors unfortunately yeah too much so you'd like to see the world through the rosy glasses sometimes but you can't and unfortunately yes you do let people yeah well let's give them the benefit of the doubt 
and then you turn around and you go well I knew that was going to happen but you don't let those that would do wrong by you take away from who you are you don't make you know like I have got every reason to be mistrusting of everybody in this world I have been so screwed over in every way but I choose not to be because I refuse to let bad people turn me into them I like who I am and quite frankly I don't like some of the other people out there they're not very nice people but I have certainly met some wonderful wonderful people and for those people that have been adding every little bit and contributing to asking questions bringing forward more information so that we might look at what is actually going on in well the complex layers of yeah nightcap or minjimbal I mean one human being alone is complicated enough there are at least 35 people that are heavily involved with this uh, nightcap on Minjimbal and each one of them has their own <laughs> complications and needs to be put in context with all the other people and it's it's not an easy thing to untangle because when it's deliberately done to conceal and deceive it takes a bit to pull back the layers and find out what's going on. So anyway, enough of the deep and em <laughs> Let's get on to some facts in the real world, shall we? But before we get on to the real world stuff and I bring myself down to the facts and figures that can be quantified in this reality so that we may change the events that we participate in. And that's all we have to do from one second to the next. Everything I've just said is now my past. It is part of my history, something I can reflect on. And yet in the moment it becomes the potential of the future of what we create. You have to understand that only living in this reality can we actually change anything. And I suppose that's why I spent so many years out there <laughs> finding this out that only in this reality with real issues can you make a difference. I've prepared my whole life for myself to be able to express my uniqueness to other people. And I know I'm unique. <laughs> I've, I've lived most of my life with criticism because I have never fitted in anywhere. You know, even in the most obscure groups where you'd think, well, I've got to fit in there. No, I don't in the sense that I realize that all of us are unique. Whilst we can fit in with other groups, we are all unique with our own thoughts, our own consciousness, and our own sense of mortality. We know that we are living in bod bodies that don't last. It starts, it's got an in-between period, then it's got a cut-off point. So what you do in between is all a matter of choice. And the only way that you can create changes in the future are by the choices you make now. So I suppose that everything I've been through has been to prepare me for the fact that no, you can't knock me down and tell me I'm something I know I'm not. You can't like this guy that, yeah, it just reminds me so much of this, uh, my son, this guy, but hang on, I'll show you. This guy here. I mean, yeah, I saw a, a few comments and I thought, wow, he sounds so much like my son. Yeah, you know, he, my son will come to me and because something comes out of his mouth there you go, that's proof or he can write it down <laughs> and it's proof 
<laughs> I laugh at it. And that pisses him off. I shouldn't laugh at him. I said, that's not proof. Just because it comes out of your mouth or you can write it down, that's not proof. And he said, well, what is proof? And I said, well, actually, we could go back to Edgar Casey here and I could say that it is the best advice that I ever heard come from anyone's mouth is that when someone said to him, you know, can you prove what you're saying? He said, the, the only question he asked was, what do you require as proof? Because what is proof for one is not proof for another. So what do you require as proof? And in that sense, no one can prove to another. We can only prove it to ourselves. But this guy, he actually thought that because he wrote stuff down, that was proof. And he finished it off with saying too, and hey, Sammy boy, if you do want to give up that, um, and the evidence of that is just as simply obtained, hey, and you and like others, you said, if you wanted to know, simply ask. Well, I'm asking, where is the evidence? You know, evidence is something like birth certificates, something official, you know, that, that goes by the laws that we're governed under. Not just hearsay, talk, 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 or hey, I wrote it down, it's proof. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, he's just so much like my son. You know, this is where I have looked at so many things. And in the, this real world, there are certain things that can be claimed as factual because these are the rules we, we live under. Like it or lump it, that's the way it is. So there are certain things that can be evidenced as fact and also evidenced as fact that people have done the wrong thing too. Like, you know, nobody's addressing the fact that Adrian Brannock is a bankrupt and that he has been conducting highly illegal activities because he is a bankrupt, he cannot be doing what he's doing. That is inescapable, but nobody is standing up for that. No, he is not. But anyway, this 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 boy that reminded me of um sorry, speak of the devil, that was my son. Anyway, um yeah, I'll wait for him to go back to his room. <laughs> So um, I thought, well, this is curious, isn't it? Here we've got Samuel McMurtry um, coming and leaving me all these comments and everything. <laughs> and he actually tells me that through all his comments and everything that I've been told and I should listen. And there's my proof. Now, I should admit I'm wrong. <laughs> Sorry, Sammy. It doesn't work that way. You're still a bit young, aren't you? <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to have to take a break here. Sorry, I had to compose myself because I thought of his comment. <laughs> My son walks in. He complains about all the tabs I've got open in the browser, but it's not only one browser I've got open, I've got about four. Yeah, you know, well, you know, research goes from one place to another and I like to be able to look at all the information together. And when I do my videos, I actually put the tabs up there to remind me. A lot of the time I don't get to them, but um, yeah. Or they were just left open because I was actually looking at that, you know. But it just um, made me think of how my son comes in and complains that are you on there got all these tabs open again? The internet's so slow. <laughs> yes, it interferes with the speed of the internet, apparently, when I've got all these tabs open. But, you know, I suppose real research in the real world's just not as important as gameplay. Anyway, <laughs> so, yes. Um, Samuel McMurtry, I thought, well, yes, let's... I just, while he was responding over the time, I thought, well, who is this guy? So, you know, I checked him out. 
And then I found out that he, you know, had, had something to do with Gorilla Garage and it's spelled Gorilla as in Gorilla Warfare type stuff, you know. And I thought, yeah, that suits because I saw a picture that sort of thought, yeah, I could see that. So I said the name suits, yeah, suits you, mate. Yeah, the picture you've got on your um, YouTube channel makes you look like a stuffed shirt, but that's not really you, is it? You're more on the, the gorilla garage side of things. <laughs> Suits you. So, yes, we had this rather um, fun conversation backwards and forwards as he um, confirmed information for me because, you know, when you don't know something, you go fishing, see what bites. And he confirmed so much through all the comments, you know, that... Um, yeah, he's Gorilla Garage. Yes, he's associated with the one in Cairns that he wants to set up there. Yes, well, Samuel McMurtry. Hmm, Mark McMurtry. Where was McMurtry has ties to a garage in Lismore? Nice lead. Thanks. Perhaps I will give you a call, buy some parts and check the serial numbers. Perhaps not. So from that, he got, I, I said that um, Mark owns the business, yeah, it's Mark's business, <laughs> and uh, he put his own take on it, so yes, I mean, I, I do have a little bit of a, a fishing expedition with some people on here, and uh, yeah, he did remind me of my son, and I thought, well, let's see if he responds the same way. He did too. I mean, he ends up saying that, you know, everything I've said you've been shown, it's proof. <laughs> I said it. I wrote it. It's proof. Oh, yes, dear. Of course it is. Yeah. Go back to school. When you graduate, come into the real world, talk to you then. Other than that, I think I'll say sayonara. Samuel McMurtry, and we'll move on to the next thing, eh? See, now this tab was open because I wanted to be reminded about I keep forgetting to update on the plantation timber. You know, all that uh, timber that we've seen in previous videos that covers a lot of it and how many millions they actually say it's worth in the Nightcap or Mingimble documentary? Well, it, apparently it's not quite that accurate. You see, for plantation timber to be worth anything, it has to be uh, maintained, thinned, and that never happened right from the word go. The timber's worthless, which is why it's still standing, which is why they haven't chopped any of it down and sold it off rather than trying to uh, milk human cows for every drop of scent they can get out of them. So the plantation timber is worth zero. It would actually cost them money <laughs> to restore the land to original because they can't make any money out of selling the timber. And that would also explain too why back in, oh, I can't even remember now, but it was a few years ago, they actually tried uh, getting a DA to set up a, a manufacturing shed to make shingles in. So they obviously looked at turning the plantation timber into shingles, but that never eventuated. That's an assumption anyway, as best as one can make. Because I do try to clarify through here. It's like old Sammy Boy says, you should tell people that it's your opinion. It's like, oh mate, you listen to one video and you think you know it all. I suppose you think you know it all and everything is the truth and evidence just simply because it came out of your mouth and you wrote it down. Oh dear. Sorry. <laughs> Off subject again. Here's amusing though. I had quite an entertaining and informative time with him. Then he got boring because you know I did get enough of that um, run around from my son. <laughs> so yes, back onto the plantation timber. Worth zip. Nothing zero. In fact, it's going to cost some money to actually do what they promised and restore the land. Mind you, they could always just sell it off for firewood, 
there's always a demand for firewood. <laughs> and, I mean, you go to Nimbin and you try and get, what, four logs for 25 bucks or something. And this was quite a few years ago. So, I mean, you can make a shit ton out of selling timber for firewood. And so what if it might burn quickly? You know, for the people that are buying it, they might actually like that it burns quick and hotter, especially during the cold winter months when you want to warm up a bit and the damn greenish stuff they give you is just, yeah, you can't even get the stuff lit. So that would have been a good market that you could have got into, selling all that off for uh, firewood. People would have, you would have had a lot of it gone and been able to restore it in what, last six years you've had to actually make something of the land and all you've done is take from it and come up with excuses on why nothing ever gets done and why all the money that people put in to get something done suddenly disappears and all that bad paperwork over all those com companies all coming back to the same accountant too and the same slimy uh, lawyers and uh, liquidators and all these others that slither, birds of a feather, are flocking together. Well, you know, it doesn't matter what business they run. If a crime's been committed, a crime's been committed. And you don't get to hide behind your profession. It, it's not, uh, you know, oh, I'm a liquidator and nobody can touch me because I've got it all figured out. No one is untouchable. No one. Not even the damn queen, even though she thinks she is. <laughs> hey, we all have a lifespan. We all come with an expiry date, don't we? Well, with this body anyway. Shall we go on to the next thing? Yeah, another reason I open tabs up beforehand is because they take time to load sometimes. Now, this uh, one here is on the Mount Burrow commercial. The first thing I wanted to point out, and yes, it was pointed out and reminded to me that I want you to take a closer look here. Sorry, I can't make it any bigger. But if you notice here that the whole commercial district is actually all marked in blue. Now, can you see that the blue is actually on the other side of the road as well? It's easy to forget when you're talking about the business district that it is only this area here. Let's click off that. So it is only this area here that you think you're talking about, which is the active businesses. But there is still this large land parcel over here that's attached to the uh, Mount Burrell Commercial and 3220 Cargill Road. Now, I'm only bringing this to people's attention because you need to be aware that there are certain things that are going on at Mount Burrell. It seems to be the focus of all their activities at the moment. They changed uh, they added a director on the 17th of November. They added Cherie Stokes again. So her and Philip Dixon are, you know, old pals. They've done this with a lot of companies. Philip Dixon and Cherie Stokes together. Yes, but that's um, another video. This uh, section is just to remind people that there is perhaps more attention that should be focused on now that they've apparently reacquired back 3222. They've spent a large amount of money from investors to, if it has been Phoenix back to them, to come up with the two million. That's a lot of money. Now there's apparently 3.75 million worth of shareholdings in the Mount Burrell commercial. Wonder how they paid two million if it was Phoenix back to three triple two. And when they said back in, you know, they did the video and said we've reclaimed it 
and they've continued to sell 3222 as if they owned it and yet it was always under the control of the liquidator. So the representations that they've made publicly and the liquidator has allowed this to happen. He has not stopped it. He's also been made aware of it <laughs> and will not act on it. So thereby he has shown himself to be complicit. Yes, it's a little bit more involved with, uh, with that than that, but uh, that's something again for another video. That's something else that um, Anne's been up to. Yes, she gave me permission to use her name. <laughs> She's been really going to town with the information that she's been getting. And she's looking like she's given all these people an opportunity to do the right thing and they have failed. So now they have failed to uphold the law and investigate the things that they should have. And those that have been promoting it have not come out publicly to... <laughs> well, pretty much divorce themselves from them, you know. Uh, they've continued to let that narrative that they push remain there, you know. Go by in it, it's good stuff. Well, that is something that the courts are going to determine, not public opinion. <laughs> or the, the narrative that these on Nightcap on Minjimbul can attempt to create through abuse of the legal system and the courts. The way they use lawyers to attack people. We've heard in the Vox about how it's a deliberate attempt. Everything they do is designed to attack and stop them from being exposed. Well, the trouble is that, you know, when you've got a bunch of wild dogs, all you need is a bigger pack to come along and your wild dogs are going to get put down and guess what there's a bigger pack out there now than you <laughs> I'm sorry I'm loving it thank you to everybody thank you very much for all the help you've been giving and for anyone that does still have information that you haven't added I ask that perhaps you might be able to send it forward now or it's just going to um, miss the boat as far as getting added to the weight of what's coming against them. Yes, a lot of people, a lot of crimes. It takes time to put it together so it sticks. And yes, we want it to stick, don't we? <laughs> So I don't care how much I've got to drag this out from their perspective. Oh, I'll take it out tomorrow and present it. No, if I do that, it will fail. I've got to make sure that I cover my bases and that the accusations, allegations of charges can stick. I mean, bankruptcy, concealing shares during bankruptcy, that, that's a no-brainer. I don't even have to prove that. That is just so obvious and it's all dated. Six days before his final bankruptcy hearing, he cannot deny it was not deliberate. He cannot deny that it still exists in his wife's name. He cannot deny all the shareholdings. It's all on paper. And Sammy boy, that's what you call evidence. What's on paper? and what can be proved in a court. Because as I said, we live under an accepted general law. And what we accept as evidence and proof of evidence, there's plenty of it out there. I'm amazed that you know, none of you haven't tried to get a passport out of the country and go to where there's no extradition treaty. <laughs> You know what's coming for you. Or have you convinced yourself that much of your own con that you actually believe you are doing no wrong? Ah, no. Not buying that. You're just that arrogant 
and you've got away with it for a few years, you think you're going to continue to get away with it? As I said, when you've got a, a couple of mongrel dogs, all it takes is a bigger pack, and you're stuffed. And you know, the thing is that one of your own mongrel dogs sold himself out. He gave away so much evidence to be used against him this last year. He has been advertising publicly and he is a bankrupt. Oh, that, that, I mean, you know, you think you're so smart and yet that is one of the most stupidest things I've ever seen. I just can't, but thank you, you know. Proof is proof, isn't it? And that is acceptable proof when it comes out of your own damn mouth. <laughs> and you gave permission for it to be viewed publicly. Oh, even better. But being a bankrupt is only a title, isn't it? It's got no legal obligations. Wrong. Wasn't it the ATO that bankrupted you? You said you had no legal obligations to them too, didn't you? No legal obligations to pay back loans or credit cards. Oh, you've been wiggling your way out of them for so long. Should have known when the ATO caught up with you that you were running out of luck. And you're on your last life now. And you gave yourself up for it. Oh, mate, you're brilliant. Good on you, Adrian Brenner. Keep it up. <laughs> and I think on that note I've covered hang on I'll just check note sidetracked again what's going on at Mount Bowl yes I think that um, watching the commercial district there's something really going on with them there there's uh, a lot of um, like I've been I pointed out that land across the road from the caravan park because I've been told that uh, uh, anonymous uh, purchasers um, tried to get land that would have given them access at a different road point so that they could utilise it for the caravan park. Because the reason they can't use it right now is because the access is on a dangerous corner and it's not good for caravans. So ultimately this was done with the uh, facilitation of a, another cohort that they've got working. You know how they have real estate agents, lawyers, accountants, um, yeah I suppose what you'd call starts and, and uh, warrels there, accountants aren't they? I don't know pretty, um, well let's just say that when they won't even join a reputable body to govern their activities to make sure they're legit and above board, that should raise a few flags with people. If they're not registered with the Real Estate Institute, if they're not registered with the Insolvency Institute and all the Financial Institute and other places like this, this is a warning sign to people that these people do not want to be held accountable by the same basic rules and guidelines that govern safe dealings to keep things on the up and up, to keep things honest. So people that don't want to keep things honest don't join these regulatory bodies or become members of them and become reputable. They stay outside of that and would be called unreputable. So you've got to watch out for ones like that. Because these guys at uh, Nightcap on Mingimble like to use unreputable professionals so that the legitimate governing bodies are toothless tigers. Again, this is something that they've done deliberately. You can't get use a legitimate lawyer or accountant that answers to basic codes of ethics uh, because they need someone that won't, <laughs> you know, someone that will do the job on the wrong side of what's right and will hide it so that it looks right 
and can explain it so it looks right. Can dumbfound people and say, I'm the professional. I know it's right. I know what I'm talking about. It works for them. But it's time to realise that there are many unsavoury, unregistered professionals out there that are utilised because, well, they hide behind their unregistered uh, status. They do not want to be held accountable for their activities. They do not want someone investigating them. Why not? Anyone that's doing the right thing isn't afraid of anyone looking. Come and have a look. Doesn't matter what. Yeah. And that's an open book for you. When you get closed books, poor accounting, and all of these businesses are consistent, consistent over the years, same people associated, same level of bad record keeping, same level of inability to prove through legitimately kept records that these things have been going on. That in itself is a crime. And how many times they've done it, you know, it might have been used as an excuse in court once, twice. Maybe a judge might say, oh, you know what, I'll just follow up what the previous judge said and I won't get too much into this bullshit. But the thing is, you have failed constantly, incompetently, deliberately to keep bad records so that you cannot be held accountable. That in itself is a crime, too many times now. But anyway, I suppose uh, Philip and Cherie have got a little bit on their plate with Mount Burrell Commercial at the moment. They've only got, uh, well, <laughs> I doubt they've got any pay and lease holders. Or is um, McMurtry's brother working for a wage and they're just uh, paying a wage? Well, I suppose when you've got a limited income, but then you shouldn't have a limited income. There's 3.75 million worth of shares there. But then if you've used some of that money to actually get three triple two through that and then buy that, then that's not there. And now you need to bring in Cherie to make the books look pretty and bring it all up to scratch and code before you hand it over to somebody else who will then throw it under the bus. I don't know. That's kind of a little bit of an out there theory. Are they getting ready for a fire sale with Mount Burrow Commercial? I mean, seriously, they've been forking out a lot of money. Either, either they've been getting millions from investors or they've got to be coming up with it from somewhere else. Three triple two costs $2 million and they're not getting an income through the commercial anymore. And they've put in an offer to purchase f to get the access through um, that other block on the other side of the road to the caravan park. Where are they coming up with the money for that? So there's lots of things. Oh yeah, and let's not forget, do they still owe Peter Van Lyshout money? Or have they just made him another empty promise? Well, we've heard how he, he's looked at in uh, the boxes. Both of them mention PVL. And he's just a cow to milk. And a pretty naive man. You know, you'd think that someone that got to be in the position he is in would have actually done it because he had some smarts. He trusts these people. That's not smarts. That's sticking your head in the sand and hoping that you're wrong. <sighs> Yeah. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to leave it and say goodbye. I'll catch you next time. <laughs>